Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to Biomond Live. Thank you very much for joining us. My name's Rebecca and I'm going to be your host for this evening's webinar. But presenting for you this evening is my colleague Vicky Phillips, who is uh, the UK Clinical Support Manager here at Biomond. So before we formally begin the webinar, I'll just go through a few quick housekeeping points with you all. So tonight's session, we're expecting it to last around about 50 minutes, but we will set aside 10 minutes or so just at the end for any questions that you may have for us. Now, do let us know you're here by saying hello in the chat and feel free to use that as a space to network amongst yourselves as well. Um, and if you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, both the chat button and the Q&A button can be found just at the bottom of your screens. Um, and you can use the Q&A button for any questions that you got for us as we go through the session this evening. So that's it from me for now. I'll pass you over to Vicky, but I hope you all enjoy Biomond Live. And once again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for everyone who's here after a little bit of break in the webinars. Um, we're going to be doing a good rounded session today. So this is a great session if you are brand new to larval therapy, but also if you just want a refresher as well. So we're going to have a look at um, how larval therapy can benefit your practice and your patients. We'll look at how the larvae works. We'll help you increase your confidence in choosing wounds that are suitable and and make sure that you're happy talking to patients about what love therapy is and, and how, what they can expect during the treatment. And we'll go through, of course, the logistics of prescribing ordering application. Um, and I've got some evidence as well to back up um, the known benefits of larval therapy. And we'll talk a bit, little bit about cost effectiveness as well. But before we get started with that, I do want to touch a little bit on debridement. So the first and main reason you might use um, larval therapy is for debridement, although there are a couple of other times when um, it can benefit the wound and we'll go through that further in a minute. Uh, debridement, of course, can be performed in a variety of different ways, um, but the main goals are all um, the, of the, all the methods are the same. So to allow progression from inflammation to proliferation, remove bacterial burden and biofilm, prevent or treat uh, infection, reduce malodor and exudate, accurate wound assessment and staging, um, preparing the wing for grafting or topical negative pressure, improve quality of life, arguably the most important. Uh, debridement is a part of the inflammatory stage of wound healing. So naturally our bodies would send blood to the wound and that would have white blood cells and other cells such as fibroblasts in it. Um, but sometimes our bodies can't do that alone. And this is where debridement interventions may become useful. And that includes larval therapy. Um, the objection, uh, the objective, sorry, of debridement isn't just to clean the wound, but make it free from visible slough um, so that the wound can then go on to proliferate and move towards healing, which it can't do when unviable tissue or bacteria are present in the wound. In the pictures here, you can see a diabetic foot ulcer, uh, and this was debrided using larval therapy. You can clearly see the devitalized tissue uh, has been softened and lifted, leaving a clean wound surface, which can then go on to proliferate, granulate, and eventually heal. Um, the wound could, um, couldn't do that with all that devitalized tissue there, had that not been lifted. Um, it may have become infected and it may have led to much more serious consequences for that patient. So debridement is just the first step in the healing process. And this case shows just how effective debridement can be followed on by a treatment um, that supports wound closure, such as grafting, top negative pressure. Uh, but do remember that grafting would be ineffective if used on a wound with dead tissue and bacteria present. So um, debridement really is essential for effective wound bed preparation. Now let's have a little think about how long larval therapy has been used in wound care. You can see on this slide a really, really long time. So we have evidence to show that larvae um, were used by the Aboriginal Australians, the Mayans, there's writing about it in the Bible, all the way through to the First and Second World Wars, when there was a little bit of blip in usage of, of larval therapy, mainly because of the advent of penicillin, which became readily available and understandably grew to become the first line method of treating infection and love therapy became less and less popular. 
but good for larval therapy in the 1990s the rise of resistant bacteria led to a review of how antibiotics were being used and a number of studies into larval therapy as an option in wound care led to a revival in its usage. So in 1994, Biomon Germany was formed and uh, just over 10 years later, Zoobiotic was formed in the UK as a spinner of the NHS. Originally, they were separate companies, but in 2010, Zoobiotic acquired Biomon and is now the company that uh, you know and hopefully love today. And we are the only supplier of Larvae in the UK. So looking a little bit at the types of flies we use to get our maggots, uh, in Europe we use the common green bottle fly, also known as Lucilia sericata, and we use this fly for a few reasons. So firstly, they are indigenous to the UK and Europe, so we know that um, her larvae, you know, the, the Lucilia sericata larvae will survive in our climate. Secondly, the eggs are incredibly robust, meaning we can disinfect them to a standard, which makes them suitable for use in a medical setting. Thirdly, they are safe for human use, and this is because they only consume dead, devitalized tissue. So in other words, they, uh, their secretions can tell the difference between dead, um, unviable cells and healthy, perfused tissue, and they'll only break down the dead, unviable cells. And this can be really great to know if you've got a patient who is concerned, maybe they're wondering if they're going to be left with this big uh, cavity where their leg ulcer used to be. Um, you can reassure them that that's not going to happen and that the larvae cannot dig or tunnel or burrow into healthy human tissue either. Um, and finally, uh, the behaviour of the green bottle fly is very predictable, which means that we can come up with the same care plan, which you can use for every single patient uh, that has larval therapy. So here you can see a life cycle of the green bottle fly. Uh, sometimes it's quite handy to know a little bit about this, especially when you're talking to patients and carers about what to expect during the therapy. Um, it's of course difficult to know which came first, the fly or the egg, but I always start with the fly. And what happens is the male and the female fly will mate and then the female fly will lay her eggs on a food source. So in our case, in our facility, that is a synthetic protein. And the, when they're on that synthetic protein, they um, will, or any food source for that matter, they will um, incubate and they'll take about 12 to 24 hours to hatch. And that depends on temperature. So in our facility, we can control that a little bit. Um, so the hotter it is, the faster they'll hatch. And when, we're, when the larvae hatch, they're around two to four millimetres in length um, and they'll grow to about 10 to 12 millimetres after feeding for around four days. And it's worth noting that the larvae will only feed for four days. They won't carry on even if there is still food source there. They can't keep growing. Uh, they can't keep feeding infinitely. Whilst the larvae are eating and growing, they'll go through three different stages. So they start at larvae one stage or L1 stage um, at one day old, and then they're taken off the wound um, and they finish their growing at L3 stage, which is about five days old. Now in the wild, naturally, they would go off and find somewhere dry uh, and their skin would harden and it would turn into their pupae shell. And then they would go into a cycle of, um, of uh, pupation. Basically, they would, and that would take about seven to 10 days for them to metamorphosize and emerge as flies. And obviously we don't let them do that bit in wound care, but you can see if the patients were worried that they were gonna end up with flies on their wound, that it's incredibly unlikely because the conditions of the wound are not gonna be dry enough. And also it's a very long gap between them being taken off the wound and them ever emerging as flies. So for those of you who don't know, all of the larvae produced um, or used rather in the UK and Ireland are produced in a facility in South Wales in Bridgend. Um, the first picture here you can see is the exterior view of one of our clean rooms. There's about half a dozen rooms in the process and each of these rooms in the facility is classed as a different grade of sterile. Um, and the product is constantly being tested to ensure it's safe to ship out to clinicians. 
The second photo you can see here is our fly room, or we call it the fly hotel. And this is our colony of flies. It's a closed colony, so that ensures that we keep purity and sterility in the system. And there's a three week cycle of flies here, ensuring that eggs are constantly being laid by the females. And so they lay their eggs and they're harvested, sterilized. And then half of those larvae that hatch are sent out to use in clinical areas and the other half are kept back to produce the next generation. Here you can see a very basic overview of the production process. And you can see the production team um, throughout the whole process will wear sterile outfits to ensure that they're not bringing anything into the system. And as the process moves through each stage, uh, the room increases in sterility and the air is purified to remove any contamination. So like I said, firstly, the fly eggs are harvested from the fly hotel. They are disinfected for, to remove any contaminating bacteria, fungi, viruses, whatever. Ever. And then the process is repeated once those eggs have hatched. And then the um, hatched larvae are placed into something called a biobag, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then within five hours of transfer, the products will leave our site and they'll arrive the next day with the clinician for use that day or the day after. So how do the larvae actually work? Well, what they'll do when the larvae are placed onto a food source, so in our case, devitalized tissue, they will excrete and secrete enzymes, which all work together to liquefy that tissue um, and they effectively drink it back up as their nutrition. It's not a very glamorous way of eating um, or consuming uh, food, I should say, uh, but it's what we call extracorporeal digestion. So it happens outside of the body and that means that it is very gentle. Now, the larvae do have some structures that help with this process, and you can see in the zoomed in picture here, they have these two mandibles, and they'll use those to score the devitalized tissue. Sometimes they'll use them to loosen um, the or anchor themselves onto the slough, I should say, just if it's very thick and it needs a little bit more extra effort to get those enzymes to really penetrate it. Um, you can also see in the picture that they have rough areas to their skin. So what they'll do is as they're moving around the wound the devitalized tissue, tissue would catch on those rough areas and then that again will help those enzymes really penetrate the tissue very um, quickly and effectively. Now generally most patients won't be able to feel any of this. Um, I've had the larvae on my hands and my feet and I couldn't feel them but um, it is normal for patients to start feeling the larvae towards the end of the process or sort of day three, day four as they're getting bigger. Um, so you might have patients report to you that they can feel something moving or pulsating, um, sort of different words like that. Um, the only time to be a little bit cautious is if you have a patient who has pain prior to starting larval therapy and it can be quite an intense process for them because we're exposing potentially the nerve endings very quickly so it's just something to bear in mind. And as I've mentioned, the larvae don't touch the healthy tissue. The secretions are selective, so they can tell the difference between the healthy and unhealthy tissue, and they'll only break down the unhealthy tissue. Um, and this can be really useful when treating wounds with microstructures, such as tendons, ligaments, um, as you, you would have in the foot, like you can see in this um, example here. Um, and it's also worth noting that it's not uncommon for the wound to appear more extensive as a result of larval therapy, um, because it's not so easy for us to see with our eyes just how much devitalized tissue there is. Um, just to explain this case study, this was a paraplegic lady who was in hospital. She was transferring from bed to chair and knocked her foot and you can see it became quite ulcerated. She was actually originally offered uh, amputation, which she refused, fair enough. Um, so the alternative given to her was larval therapy. She had two rounds and you can see just how much happier and healthier it looked in the middle slide, um, middle picture, and then I uh, had conservative dressings and went on to heal fully. And most importantly, she got to keep her foot. 
Uh, now, another, another benefit of love therapy is how fast it is. So often only one treatment is required and 90% of wounds are fully debrided within two rounds, so eight days. Uh, and this is a lot quicker than many other methods, aside from surgical in sharp, of course. Um, this lady was um, a lady who knocked her leg in the community. The wound actually started life as a hematoma and began to slough as the wound was managed with a mixture of conservative dressings and sharp debridement. Um, she was eventually seen by TVNs um, and they saw how uh, sloughy it had become and they recommended maggots. And you can see one round, so four days later, just how much of a difference it's made. So really quick uh, turnaround for um, this patient. Uh, one of the other things that we like about larval therapy is that it's also proven to be antibacterial and it achieves this in a couple of different ways. So as the larvae ingest that liquefied tissue, which they've created, they'll also ingest any bacteria, a fungi, other little microbes like that, which are present in the wound and they'll break them down through their gut processes. Um, and also their physical presence um, and the debridement action stimulates the production of exudate by the patient's body, uh, which in turn flushes back bacteria from the wound. So uh, you can see just how effective the larvae have been in this picture here with this patient and their very infected leg ulcer. Two rounds of larval therapy, so eight days, and you can see just how much happier and healthier the whole leg's looking, really. Now, one of the biggest challenges we see in wound care a lot is biofilms. We do talk about these a lot, don't we? And we know how incredibly difficult they are to see with the naked eye. So we don't always know that they are in a wound, um, but we do know that they can form almost anywhere. So for example, that film that you feel on your teeth first thing in the morning, that is actually a biofilm. And we know how difficult they are to break down because they are a thousand times stronger than the free floating bacteria, which are loose in the wound. And as a result, can have a huge impact on wound healing processes. Now, often slough can be an indication of biofilm presence, but you can get a biofilm on a wound that's static and doesn't have any slough or devitalized tissue present. It will just it will just present as a non healing wound. Um, and mostly love therapy isn't always sort of perceived as the first choice for these wounds due to the lack of food source that is um, supposedly in these wounds. But one of the benefits of love therapy is their ability to break down these biofilms so the enzymes they produce will break down that protective coating that the bacteria create and then they'll go on to ingest the bacteria um, and we also know that the larval secretions have been found to prevent biofilm reformation as well allowing the wound to you know go on to do what it wants to do and heal before the free floating bacteria can come along and form that biofilm that they want to do this picture here, this is a four foot amputation. You can see it's kind of sloughy, which can sometimes be um, indicative of a biofilm. Um, maybe you wouldn't normally think to put larvae on that, but this person had one round of larval therapy, so four days, and you can see that wound bed is looking a much healthier color. And we've got some um, pictures from um, in vitro investigation to in illustrate this further. We conducted um, the investigation using complex biofilm grown on pig skin explant. At the first image you can see is mature pseudomonas biofilm prior to the larvae being applied. The second photo you can see after the larvae have been on for 24 hours how much they've broken that biofilm down. There's actually a five log reduction um, and by 48 hours it's completely gone. And the same is true with Staphylococcus. So again, the first picture shows how that mature biofilm looked prior to the larvae being put on. Second picture, again, they've broken it down significantly in just 24 hours and by 48 hours it completely gone. Now, a little known fact about larval secretions is that they have anti-inflammatory capabilities. So these secretions have the ability to reduce inflammation in a wound by stopping an over-inflammatory response. And what they do is they reduce the levels of plaque 
pro-inflammatory cytokines and macrophage inflammatory pro proteins by stimulating an increased production of anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the precise debridement also helps and by removing that dead tissue and bacteria which prevents cellular action such as growth factor production um, and so the, the maggots will aid and encourage the body to move to the next phase, the proliferation phase of wound healing. And we also know that the larval therapy has been shown to have huge positive impacts on static wounds and can have benefit after initial debridement. So again, often these wounds are not considered suitable for maggots, but you can see in the photos on this slide, they can promote proliferation and they'll do that by stimulating fibroblast, fibroblast migration and angiogenesis. And you can see that the second picture after one round of larval therapy, how much happier and healthier that wound bed is looking and it will go on to continue to granulate and, and heal. Uh, finally, the last bit of evidence I just wanted to talk about is that we have um, evidence to suggest that the maggots improve microcirculation in the tissue, um, not only in the wound, but around the wound, in the peri-wound as well. Um, these images are three hyperspectral scans showing how the circulation continues to improve throughout the duration of the therapy. You've got the scale down the right um, of each image, which is displaying oxygenation using colour. So we've got blue at the bottom of the scale, red at the top. Um, the first picture shows the baseline of the wound. So we've got some perfusion in the wound uh, and surrounding tissue, um, but not really a lot in the wound, to be fair, in itself. Um, during the treatment, you can see it start to increase inside those little circles. And it's seen much more clearly by the end of the therapy where there's much more red, much more yellow, both in the wound and around the wound. Um, so you can see how it compares to that first image at the start of the therapy. Now, how they do this, we don't really know yet, uh, but it does match up with what we've seen um, in previous slides where we've talked about um, cell proliferation, angiogenesis, anti-inflammatory capabilities. So they're really very clever little things. Now, something that is really important if you want to have good, successful um, experiences with larval therapy is talking to patients about any misconceptions they have, any concerns they might have about the therapy whilst they're having it. Even if they're not expressing uh, concerns to you verbally, it's really important to make sure you've addressed anything that they might be worried about. Um, often reasons patients end up refusing maggots is because they are worried about um, the larval escaping, biting, turning into flies halfway through therapy. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more later, but all of the larvae come in something called a bio bag, which is heat sealed. So the larvae can't escape unless someone cuts the bag open, which hardly enough, no one really wants to do. They don't have any teeth, which we've talked about, so they can't bite or chew. And you've seen in the life cycle that it's incredibly unlikely that they'll be on the wound long enough or will have the right conditions to turn into flies. So um, you've already got some good answers from what we've discussed, uh, but it's also important to manage expectations. So it might be valuable to talk about the um, change in, in sensation that patients might experience um, It's as they grow. Certainly, they're more likely to feel them as they get to the later end um, of the therapy. Um, also things like activities of daily living might be impacted. So for example, the patient's not necessarily going to be able to shower or bathe the area um, whilst the maggots are on the wound. Other things to bear in mind is that the uh, larvae do come with their own special unique smell. It's certainly not going to be the worst thing that you guys as healthcare professionals will have smelt, but that musty smell that comes with larva therapy can be a little bit disconcerting to patients if they're not expecting it. So it is worth having those discussions. Let them know they might smell something, but you can also reassure them and say, look, it will get better with each dressing change and it will go when the larvae go. You are going to see a wetter wound. And again, if the patient can see their wound, it's worth telling them they will see an increase in exudate. And that exudate is likely to come uh, out a sort of dark brown, reddish colour, which can be really easy to mistake for blood if you're not expecting it. So again, it is worth telling them that they might see these colours, but they are normal and nothing to worry about. Um, what I would say with all of this, though, is that we do have patient information leaflets, which you can download from our website 
or you can ask us to send some out to you. Um, and if you need them in other languages, we can sort that out as well. So, you know, we have got resources there to help you have those conversations. So let's have a little think about types of wounds you might use them on. You've already seen a few examples already, um, but there's a few more here. So this list isn't exclusive, but you might see them used on pressure ulcers, leg ulcers, diabetic feet, hematomas. Um, but let's go through the list we have here in a little bit more detail and understand how they might benefit those different wound groups. So starting off with pressure ulcers, um, we have seen ma uh, maggots used very successfully in treating pressure ulcers, in particular your deeper category three, category four pressure ulcers, uncategorizable pre pressure ulcers. I still want to say unstageable. Um, however, it's really important to note that the patient will need to offload the area um, during the larvae, um, during the therapy, because the larvae don't like being sat on because they'll get um, squashed and suffocate. Uh, one of the most common causes actually of larval death during treatment, if it is going to happen, is occlusion against a surface such as an air mattress or offload uh, equipment which is usually uh, plastic covered. Patients should also avoid wearing shoes for the same reasons if the ulcer is on the foot and should be encouraged to walk as little as possible. Now when we're thinking about venous leg ulcers not many people realize that maggots can actually be used very well in conjunction with compression therapy, hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, and after or before or after revascularization surgery. Um, the main, main benefit when using larvae on leg ulcers is their ability to actively remove the bio burden which is very often present in these kinds of chronic wounds and help reduce the inflammation associated with these ulcers so that compression, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and so on can have an opportunity to actually be effective. Now we do know that pain is a common issue in leg ulcers so it is really important to have some PRN analgesia ready just in case the patient needs it uh, and it's important to note that the pain is, isn't actually due to the larvae itself but it's actually thought to be the healing process commanding cell migration, nerve stimulation and oxygenation of the wound bed which can be quite painful especially if there is a level of ischemia. Thinking about diabetic foot ulcers, uh, maggots can be a great for areas where the scalpel can't reach, so they can be a useful tool for diagnosing just how necrotic a wound is. And that can be often very difficult to, to know with this group of wounds, um, you know, just how extensive that damage is. And these wounds can often look a lot worse before they start to look better. There's a lot of evidence that clearly shows that there can be a reduction in amputation rates uh, when treating DFUs with larva therapy compared to standard treatments. Um, a key point to remember, like we talked with pressure ulcers, uh, is offloading the foot completely to make sure that the maggots aren't squashed and therefore suffocated. Now, when we're thinking about traumatic wounds, there's many different types of traumatic wounds which larvae can be used on. The list here is not exclusive, um, but the key points to remember are that for burns and neck fash, larvae can be an invasive alternative to repeated surgeries, perhaps for maintenance debridement. And it'd be interesting to know if you've considered ever using larval therapy on pyoderma, um, because it can be used alongside standard steroid treatments, but um, it can have precise debridement um, without stimulating further inflammation and making the wound worse, which some other debridement methods can. The main wound type, however, on this list that we see being treated a lot is hematomas. And the clever thing with the larval secretions in these wound groups is that the chymotrypsin, which is one of the enzymes they produce, break down fibrin clots really rapidly and can therefore be used on hard and dry hematomas with really great success. So you don't always need to soften these wounds first. And then finally, if we have a little look at surgical wounds, which, which might benefit from love therapy, you can see in, for example, this picture here of a dehist abdo. Um, this lady had three rounds of maggots. And you can see, if you look closely, that um, there's evidence of granulation tissue in the bottom photo. Um, this example, um, this is the sort of thing we see a lot with maggots being used to debride these sorts of wounds, usually to prepare them for topical negative pressure. Uh, but just remember to be aware of 
things like dissolvable sutures in a surgical wound, as these can break down a lot quicker um, than you might they might normally. And larvae really shouldn't be used in wounds where you have any biological grafts or mesh because they will break them down very quickly as well. So I think something we often see with larval therapy is that it's often left to last resort. And this can often lead to patients having months or even years of treatment, which is not allowing that wound to progress and heal. But, you know, we've already talked about how larvae is, um, are safe, they're rapid and effective. And that means they can be a suitable first line treatment in a lot of situations. So, um, you know, larvae can be used to uh, considered for stuffy static wounds, but also for maybe wounds that need maintenance debridement or odour or exudate management as well. Now, as with all therapies, there are some contraindications to be aware of. So, for example, if you have a patient whose wound has a tendency to bleed, maybe it's got an exposed major blood vessel in the wound bed, um, especially if that blood vessel is necrotic, then we would consider or we would suggest considering other options. Obviously, the larvae aren't going to know that they're not allowed to touch that necrotic tissue that's stopping a blood vessel bleeding out. Um, so they will carry on, hence why we ask for something a bit more gentle. Similarly, if you've got a patient on something like warfarin or heparin and they are not within their therapeutic range, their clotting range, um, then they may be a bleeding risk. That's ha ha it's important to have a conversation as a team and decide whether you think they are a bleeding risk. Um, and if they are, then of course, you can try something else or you can wait until they're back within their therapeutic range again. It's also worth noting that because of the way the larvae work, they're going to make the wound wetter and potentially bigger as well. So because of that, your patient is therefore going to need to be able to heal a bigger and wetter wound. And if they haven't got the resources on board, maybe they've got peripheral vascular disease, that could be an issue. There are times where you might go ahead anyway. So, for example, if you're looking to support a diagnosis or if you're looking um, to do revascularization surgery afterwards, um, then, yeah, you might go ahead anyway. But it's just about being aware you are going to have a bigger and wetter wound to be managing afterwards. It's also important that I tell you that we don't have any evidence to support the use of larvae over exposed organs. So, for example, if you had a patient with a dehist abdo and there was bowel um, exposed, um, we don't have evidence to suggest what the larvae would do in that situation. Uh, the theory suggests that as long as that, that organ is happy and healthy, they're not going to touch it. But um, we haven't got the evidence to back it up. So that's really up to you guys as clinicians to decide whether that would be an appropriate use of larvae therapy or not. Um, and then finally, possibly obviously, if your patient was allergic to fly larvae or any components of the dressings, um, then you wouldn't use. As far as I'm aware, we've never had a reported allergic reaction to larva therapy, but that doesn't mean there isn't someone on the planet who is allergic. So do double check um, allergy statuses before you go ahead. And of course, with all of these and, and any aspect of larval therapy, if you want to have a chat with one of us, myself or Rebecca, about the contraindications with a specific patient then that's what we're here for and we're happy to have those discussions and we'll be honest with you about whether the patient will be suitable or not. So let's have a little think about other types of benefits larval therapy may have. Um, as you can see in this list here, we've built up a lot of evidence to support the use of larval therapy since the first publication in 1931, so a little while ago now. Um, we're confident in the evidence from our five LCTs that larvae have been proven to be safe, fast, and they've got a high probability of efficacy. Uh, and most of the benefits noted in clinical practice have been captured in the evidence. So for example, Example, the ability to treat MRSA and other antibiotic resistant bacteria. It can reduce the need for antibiotic therapies um, and has strongly shown that it can reduce amputation rates, especially for things like DFU and limb salvage, and can prevent the need for hospital admission. 
Um, and while buy bag isn't designed to replace all of these other methods, and we would never tell you to throw everything away and just use lava therapy, it can be a good addition to the toolkit and it can be a useful adjunct to other methods as well. So, you know, we're aware it isn't a one size fits all approach when it comes to wound care. And you can see in this table, um, we've outlined uh, what you might need from a debridement method and what options you have for that, that um, need. And no matter what you're experiencing in a non healing wound larvae can be considered as an option and it could potentially be considered over and above other methods in certain situations. Now everyone always talk, wants to talk about money so we have to have a look at the numbers a little bit. Um, economically larval therapy performs very well compared to other methods so as you can see here it is quick and easy to apply and uh, requires very low cost secondary dressings and does not need to be seen by a specialist. Uh, larval therapy has been viewed as being more cost effective than other debridement methods based upon things like speed, product cost, indirect costs, quality of life. Um, and one particular meaningful finding in the literature is that after successful debridement with larvae, nursing time is reduced by 67% in the week after due to the wound being more manageable. And this is due to things like the removal of the cause of exudate, odour, infection, which come with their own costs. Uh, and in this table, you can see in numbers just how larval therapy compares to other methods. And you can see that it provides the greatest cost efficiency due to the rapid debridement time. So about eight days on average, uh, low treatment cost to this, um, due to the speed at which it works and the skill slash equipment needed. Um, there's a 96% probability of debridement as proven over a 64 patient RCT and low risk of adverse events and infections. Studies have also proven lowered amputation rates, as we've talked about in the previous slides, and the reduced need for antibiotic therapy, which obviously further contributes to those cost savings. And we, because we know analgesia and antibiotics are not free, and so it's important to bear them in mind when you're thinking about the, the bigger picture about how much it costs to look after and treat a wound. So hopefully you're starting to see now that, that maggots are very easy to use, rapid, antimicrobial, cost effective, safe. Um, but let's have a closer look at how the larvae um, are used. How do we put them on a patient? Uh, starting with the bio bag, I've talked about this for a, a few times, haven't I, over the last sort of 20 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, one of the reasons bio bags are so popular is that the maggots are fully contained, contained, con contained in a heat seal bag for the full duration of the therapy so they can't um, get out of the bag like we said before unless someone cuts it open which no one wants to do but it because it's a mesh they can get their secretions through the pores they can get their mandibles through and they can do everything they need to do whilst remaining in that bag it's applied like a dressing and it's very quick to use uh, and it's designed that it could be removed at any point during the therapy so if something did happen unexpectedly you could take it off earlier um, and it's proven that actually contained larvae remove the same quantity of tissue as loose larvae might over a four day period. And actually, it's just a very good um, choice for patient acceptance if they are concerned. Sometimes just knowing that the larvae come in a little bag can be enough for them to feel comfortable about having it. The bags come in five different sizes, as you can see on the screen here, and you've got the codes that go with them. Um, and just as a little side note, the number on the code, so 200, 400 and so on, denotes how many maggots are in the bag. So a BB200 would have at least 200 maggots in it, BB400 at least 400 maggots in it, and so on and so forth. Um, so you don't need to know how many maggots you want. All you need to know is the dimensions of the patient's wound, and then you can use those to choose which bag is going to best fit it. Now we always suggest covering the whole wound, not just bits that are visibly sloughy, because there is a risk if you only cover part of the wound, you don't get 100% debridement and it can re-slough when you discontinue therapy. Um, so that might mean that you need a couple of different sizes in order to best cover it, or you might have to go for a slightly bigger bag. Um, but because it's material, you can fold it down and you can shape it to the wound. Um, obviously, just be careful not to fold a maggot in half.
Okay, now you've deemed your patient suitable for love therapy, you've figured out what bags he wants and you've got the codes, um, you need to get it prescribed. So love therapy is classed as an unlicensed pharmaceutical in the UK, so that means it needs to be a doctor, independent nurse prescriber. Some supplementary prescribers can write it up, but that very much depends on local policy. So if you are a supplementary prescriber, do double check if you are covered or not in your area. And then as with all prescriptions, that goes to pharmacy and then pharmacy will place the order with us. Um, when they place the order, we will ask for the GMC or PIN number of the person who is prescribing. That's something we have to do um, for the MHRA. Um, and as long as we receive all orders by 2 p.m. Monday to Friday, you will get a next day delivery. Um, I do suggest you allow time for pharmacy to do what they need to do. So if you can get prescriptions written up by about midday, that gives them a little bit of breathing space to get that order to us in time. Um, and and so it's orders Monday to Friday and then we deliver Monday to Saturday. So if you order on a Friday, do let us know if you need it Monday. Otherwise, it will automatically come on Saturday. We aim to get all orders to you guys by about midday, but we do rely on external couriers. So on occasion, there might be a small delay. I will always ring you if that's going to be an issue uh, and let you know. But generally, as long as the larvae arrive to you by midday, you'll have until midnight the next day to apply them to your patient. So, for example, if they had come today, I'd have until midnight tomorrow to put them on the patient. If you are holding on to them for any length of time, keep them in the box that they came in. So they'll come in a polystyrene box, which is inside a cardboard box um, and do keep them at room temperature. They should never go in the fridge or the freezer and just be mindful of things like radiators. If you're taking them out in your car because you work in the community, be careful that obviously cars can get very hot and very cold as well. So try and keep them at ambient room temperature until you're ready to use them. OK, let's have a look at how we actually apply larvae. Um, there's six steps that we go through to put larvae on a patient. First thing you're going to do is take down all of your old dressings and give the wound a really good clean. Um, usually with sterile saline, um, if you've got sterile, uh, sterile water, that's fine. Try to avoid your things like your PHMBs, octanolin, um, uh, Promsan, things like that, because we don't really know if the larvae like it or not. So stick to your basics um, when you it comes to cleaning. And then in the box, you'll get a small spot, uh, box of uh, pot, sorry, of pseudocreme. Apply a border of that around the edge of the wound. That's just to protect the periwind from becoming macerated when it's exposed to all that fluid. The bio bag comes in a yellow top test tube. So take it out of that when you're ready. Have a little look at the larvae. They'll be wriggling around and ready to go. And then you place them on the wound, making sure they have good contact with the wound bed. And they'll know dinner is served and they'll get started. Over the top of the bag, apply some saline moistened gauze. Moist but not wet because we want to give the larvae a drink, but we don't want to drown them. So make sure you wring out any excess fluid. And then over the top of that, place some simple cotton padding. So something like Zechivit, um, basic Zechivit, uh, Premier pad, Surgi pad, even just some more dry gauze if that's all you've got. Um, be mindful not to put anything on that has a gelling agent to it or is occlusive or could become occlusive when wet and then finally you can see um, in the last image we've bandaged the everything in place um, you can use yellow line blue line um, we've talked about using under compression and um, they tolerate up to 40 millimeters of mercury and four layers of compression or of course if you can't bandage the area just some tape around the padding is fine um, but if you're worried about the dressings you're using that they might become occlusive then just give us a ring we're generally pretty good on knowing what's suitable for for the larvae and what's not and we'll help you find out if if that's going to be okay or not so i have got a little video of that just to go through it for you So here you can see cleaning the wound, saline or sterile water is fine. A thin border of pseudocreme, it doesn't have to be very thick, uh, just enough to cover the, the, the peri wound. Apply that bio bag, make sure it's got contact with the wound bed, that's the most important bit. 
this is the moist gauze going on. And then a cotton pad, simpler the better. And as I said, they're bandaging in place, but you could tape if it's not somewhere that you can use bandage. OK, so every single day whilst the larvae are in place, um, someone needs to take those secondary dressings down, have a look at the larvae, check that they are happy and healthy um, and that they're growing. Maybe top up the pseudocreme and place a, a fresh bit of moist gauze, fresh pad and fresh bandage or tape. Um, you do need to do that at least daily, but if you find that you're getting strike through more frequently than that, then you may have to increase those uh, dressings to twice or three times a day, depending on how much fluid is coming off. Um, and then on day four, you're gonna take everything off, uh, buy a bag, the whole lot, pop everything into a yellow dressings bag, tie a knot and put it in clinical waste. And it's always treated as standard clinical waste. Um, so a few things to know about and potentially make your patient aware of as well. We've already talked about a lot of these, but it is really important to make sure the patient knows about the exudate, the potential colour of it. You can see the dressing in this picture here depicts just how what sort of colour we're talking about. And it can be easy to mistake it for dry blood. So do warn your patients they might see these colours, but they are normal and nothing to worry about, as well as that smell that comes with the larvae. Um, again, it's a normal smell, but it's sometimes patients worry it's their wound, but it's not. It's just the exudate that the, um, you know, as the tissue liquefies and, and it combines with the enzymes, it just creates that smell. It's a normal smell. It's nothing to worry about. Um, and on day three, day four, when we're starting to get to the wound bed, it, you might see a little bit of light bleeding as the um, your angiogenesis is occurring and you're starting to see those granulation buds. And again, that is normal and nothing to worry about. I think the main thing to remember with larvae is that they are um, a live product and therefore need to be cared for as such. So like us, they need oxygen, they need nutrition, and in order to survive, they need um, a little bit of moisture as well, but not so much that it can drown them. Um, they do need to be kept in room temperature. They shouldn't get too hot or too cold whilst you're waiting to use them. Um, and the softer the tissue, the faster that the wound will be debrided by the larvae. So if you do have any really hard, uh, I call it knock on wood necrosis, uh, then do soften that with something off your formulary uh, prior to using the larvae. It's really, really important that you never use dressings that are occlusive. So do ask us if you are not sure and it, make sure that if it's used somewhere where there has been pressure, um, that that can be offloaded before you start using the larvae. Um, and one other thing to remember is that um, they you cannot use things like topical treatments or dressings at the same time uh, prior to, uh, you know, when you're using the, the larvae as that can actually kill the them. So that's all the theory from me. Hopefully you're starting to feel a bit more confident with larval therapy or if you're new to it, you've had a good basis. I have got a couple of case studies, but I was just wondering if uh, there was any questions. Maybe we want to start answering them now before I go on to case studies or you can start typing them in and then we can do them after the case studies. Yes, of course. So um, we've got a couple of questions. So if you want to Brilliant. answer them now, Vicky, yeah, that would be do great. It. Um, so Caroline is asking, uh, in the community with deliveries, yep. will they be sent straight to the GP surgery or can they be delivered to a patient's home? Um, they can't go to patients' homes, uh, but they can go to most clinical areas. Generally, they go to the pharmacy that places the order, um, but you can get them sent to GP clinics, um, nursing homes. It's, it's really just patients' own home that we're not allowed to send them to. Brilliant. Thank you for answering that one. And the next question from Josie, she's asking, can you still use Comfield to border a wound? Yes. So if your patient's allergic to pseudocreme for whatever reason, um, then you can use any hydrocolloid, really. So duoderm, cum fill, um, cut it into strips and create a physical border. Um, we would we would advise not using other barrier films and uh, creams simply because the enzymes break them down really, really quickly. So, yeah, pseudocreme or your hydrocolloid strips. 
Lovely, thank you. Uh, so that's all the questions for now. If you want to move on to the case studies, and yeah. we'll answer the other questions at the end. Uh -huh. And as Vicky said, everyone, if you do have questions, do please just pop them into the Q and A. Um, the button can be found just at the bottom of your screens, and then we'll answer the questions at the end. Thanks, everyone. Perhaps. Thanks, Beck. So first up, we have got a diabetic for Tulsa. This is a 55 year old gentleman, type 2 diabetic. Um, he, as you can see, sustained a really nasty ulcer as a result of poorly fitting boots, which were uh, applying pressure to his foot. And you can see it tracked all the way from the base to the top of his foot and the whole foot is looking very red and swollen. He was admitted to hospital via ED for IV antibiotics and the foot was initially treated with a silver hydrofiber. And this is how it looked a few sort of days, about a week later, maybe very sloughy. And although the foot looks a lot less inflamed, you can see the wounds not really progressed. So they decided that the base of the foot would be managed conservatively, but the top would have um, a buy bag on a BB100 to be precise. Uh, and this is how it looked four days later. You can see it looking a lot cleaner. You just about spot a little tendon exposed there. And the whole foot is looking a lot less um, red and swollen, generally a lot happier. So decided that was enough and he could go back on to sort of conservative dressings. And this is the foot nine weeks later. Um, you can see fully healed. I'll show you a little before and after so you can really appreciate um, how much better it looks. Um, and, you know, really good feedback from the patient. Didn't really feel anything. Um, no concerns about pain or anything like that. And he was just really happy that he didn't have to have any toes um, amputated, which was always a risk with that sort of wound. Next up, we've got a hematoma, 70 year old gentleman who was in hospital having radiotherapy and he knocked his shin, bless him, sustained this large hematoma. He was originally on Clexane, uh, which they stopped. And then when it was safe to do so, they opened the hematoma and evacuated it via aseptic technique. But you can see it left this really sort of flaggy wound bed on the bottom there. Um, so it needed a good clean up. So they decided to put two of our biggest bio bags side by side to um, finish off the job. And this is how it looked four days later. Um, you can always see the square where one of the bags had been. Um, but again, looking much cleaner, a little bit of clot on the left side of the picture there, but nothing really exciting to write home about. So he could then go on to more conservative dressings. And uh, most important bit is that he wasn't going to need a sort of any sort of real big package of care to look after that wound. Um, he could be discharged with very simple dressings, uh, which he really wanted to do. He really wanted to go home. So another good outcome there. And then we've got this surgical wound. Um, this was a three old gentleman. Uh, you can see this dehis surgical wound on his leg. He'd had an uh, aortic valve replacement, coronary artery bypass graft um, times three. And a few weeks later, the donor site had dehissed. They swabbed the wound, which showed Pseudomonas and MRSA positive. And originally they'd started by sharp debriding it, followed by topical negative pressure. But um, this was about three months later, this picture. You can see it's looking pretty sloughy, 100% slough coverage. Um, so they decided to get one of our longest bags, the BB300. Um, and this is how it looked after that so one round of lava therapy you can see it's actually looking a bit wider so if I show you the next picture you appreciate it's actually looking a bit wider which we said sometimes happens it looks bigger before it looks better um, but you can see a much healthier wound bed and that went on to have top negative pressure as we would um, expect um, and I believe it went on to, to heal unfortunately we never got the last photos but that really is almost it from us. Um, I'll type your questions in now if you have any. But what I will say is if you think of anything after today, there's a couple of ways to get hold of us. So the clinical helpline is run by myself and Rebecca uh, seven days a week. Um, so you can contact one of us at any time and we'll answer your questions. If it is less urgent or you want to send some anonymized photos to us to talk about if the patient's suitable, 
anything like that really that's what our email addresses are for um we do i say less urgent because we do only manage that in office hours so you won't necessarily get a response over the weekend um and if you want to learn even more about love therapy our website has got flipping loads on it so i do definitely recommend having a little browse on that um, there's lots of different learning resources on there and if you're obsessed with social media like we are, um, then do come along and find us. Uh, it's not on this slide. I forgot to add it in, but we are on TikTok as well. We are trying to be down with the kids. I realise by saying that I'm probably not down with the kids. Um, what I would say is if you've enjoyed or missed any of our webinars in the past, we do record them and upload them to uh, YouTube. So you can go back and watch some of the old ones on there. So that is a particular recommendation. Um, but like I say, that's that's pretty much it from me. Hopefully everyone's been happy with what they've learned. But if we've got any questions, now's the time to put them in. Lovely. Thank you very much, Vicky. That was a brilliant Thank presentation, you. as always. Um, so the next question we've got from Rebecca, she's asking, can larvae be used with calcinosis? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, Hey, what, Rebecca, if you can email that question to us, I will find out and I will I will answer that for you because I don't know. I've never used it against that. So, um, yeah, one for us all to learn. Yeah, no, it's an interesting one for me as well. I don't recall any uh, cases, cases with that either. No. Um, but yeah, if you do want to pop across that question, just to the clinical support email that Vicky mentioned, and um, we will, of course, get back yeah. to you on that one, Rebecca, so not to worry. Yeah, find out now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the next question then from Caroline, she's asking regarding yeah. sizes and mm -hmm. which bag to use, is mm -hmm. it best to go smaller in size or should you go larger than the wound instead? I would always go slightly bigger just because if you go smaller there's a risk you will have areas that don't get divided and then you get that re-sloughing that I talked about sometimes um, because it's material you can if it is massive you can fold it down to size so don't worry about it having huge overlaps with the peri wound um, but yeah always go slightly bigger than slightly smaller. Fab, thank you very much, Vicky. And that does seem to be it for the questions this okay. evening. But thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure to have your company. And thank you, Vicky, yeah. for doing a brilliant presentation again. Thank you very much. Um, we'll see you all again on a Biomond Live very soon. Um, we should say just quickly before we go, um, if you have been with us on Biomond Live for a long time, you'll remember mm -hmm. we did used to host webinars weekly, um, but we do host them on a monthly basis now, usually yes. the last Thursday of every month. So um, do keep an eye out. We'll post regularly on our socials and our website as well, and we'll send you emails also. But yeah, do please join us again. It would be lovely to see you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Night-night.